Good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are in the country. Thanks to the many attendees who are out there today from the housing, the pest management, and the public health world. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm Susanna Reese with the Stop Pest and Housing Program. And I wanna let you know that Stop Pest is funded by an interagency agreement between HUD and the USDA, and we provide free consultation and IPM, Integrated Pest Management Training to Affordable Housing. I encourage you to visit the Stop Pest website at stoppest.org to find out more about what we can offer. It's my honor today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Richard Cooper, the Director of Special Programs at Terminex. Rick was, first, uh, was the first pest management professional in the U.S. to begin speaking on bed bugs, drawing from his personal experience with him and his brother's company, Cooper Pest Solutions, out of Lawrenceville, New Jersey. He began speaking on bed bugs locally in 2003 to pest management professionals and gave the first ever national presentation on mo the modern bed bug resurgence at the National Conference on Urban Entomology way back in 2004 when many of us weren't even thinking about bed bugs. Since then, he's been a highly sought after speaker on bed bugs, has written countless articles for trade journals, research papers, book chapters, and was the author of the Bed Bug Handbook, A Complete Guide to Bed Bugs and Their Control. It was published in 2007, and a new edition is uh, coming out within a few months. In two th also in 2007, Cooper Pest Solutions developed the website Bed Bug Central with the aim of educating the pest management industry and other stakeholders about bed bug management. In 2010, Rick began his now completed PhD work as a research entomologist with Dr. Cheng Luang's research team at Rutgers University, focusing on bed bug management in low income housing. The Cooper and Wang team are highly productive and are the most published scientists in the field of bed bug research today. Their investigations have been translated back into practical control solutions, especially in the area of bed bug detection and monitoring. Most recently, Rick has joined the Terminex team and is excited to expand the work he's done in the Northeast to the national platform. Before I hand the controls over to Rick, I have a few things to let you know. Everybody is muted. If you have a question, send it to all or just me in the chat feature. And I notice some of you are using the Q&A and we'll, myself and my colleague Nancy will be monitoring those. Um, you can also email follow-up questions to Rick or myself and those email addresses will be at the end or you can see my email address pest at cornell.edu is on the bottom of this page. I also wanna, before I switch the page, I wanna point out that the website listed on this homepage will house the um, a recording of the presentation, so you can share that with, with uh, fellow staff and, and friends, a certificate of completion that you can download from the website, and a PDF of the presentation. If you are having sound issues, you can't hear me right now, but <laughs> hopefully this uh, will guide some people who might be having some sound issues. You have to uh, scroll over the top or the bottom of the screen to get those, those features to come up. We're going to start today by asking you to participate in 10 poll questions. Your answer to these poll questions will guide Rick's presentation. Each of these questions was designed to hit on an important element in successful bed bug management in affordable housing. Please do your best to answer the questions if you're not for a housing professional or in the pest management industry, some of these questions are going to be challenging to answer. Think about the buildings or homes that you work with for your clients and try your best to answer. I'm gonna start by pulling up the first poll question and we'll only have a few seconds to answer and um, do your best to answer. We'll go through all 10 before Rick's presentation, but these will be more relevant once you hear Rick's presentation.
thank you everyone for attending. I'd like to thank uh, Susanna for all of her hard work in getting this webinar together. And um, I'd also like to um, thank the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, as well as the USDA and uh, the Northeast IPM Center Stop Pass Program for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, so hopefully, uh, everyone's going to get some information that will benefit them uh, from today's presentation. Um, most of the work that I'm going to be presenting today comes from uh, research that has been done in affordable housing communities. And these communities uh, are in desperate need of effective pest management because um, they suffer disproportionately from high pest infestation rates, uh, typically that are driven by uh, a combination of low bid pest control and poorly written contracts, which in turn drives poor quality pest management. Um, so before we really take a, a deep dive in, um, I would like to introduce a, a concept of assessment-based pest management. And I'd like to look at why it is so important that we're moving towards this type of approach in communities that, that suffer from high pest infestation rates. So if you think about the way pest management is traditionally done in our affordable housing communities, um, it's either driven from uh, complaint-based programs uh, where we're waiting for residents to report problems to property management and then in turn responding to those reported uh, complaints with treatment. Um, or it's done where we do building-wide treatments on a monthly basis, typically visiting 100% of the apartments once a month. Uh, but, but when we're trying to uh, visit every apartment every month, the amount of time that's spent in each unit is limited as well as what is being done. Um, and, you know, jokingly in a way in the research community, we, we often refer to this as spray and pray uh, because it's, it's literally maybe a minute or two at best inside these apartments and the types of uh, control measures that are being, being implemented just simply aren't effective. So, um, you know, as a result, neither one of these methods is, is very effective. Uh, we end up putting out fires, we're not addressing spread, and communities continue to suffer from chronic infestations and very often uh, escalating infestation rates. Uh, the assessment-based approach, on the other hand, is geared for community-wide success. And in this approach, what we're talking about is uh, being proactive to identify infestations that are not being reported by residents. And when we get into these units uh, to do these inspections, we're also able to assess the severity of infestations, identify different challenges and obstacles to control. And then this allows us to properly allocate our resources in the correct places uh, in, a, in an effort to achieve long-term community-wide control of pests. So I, I think as we go through this uh, webinar today, you're gonna see that this is typically not the way uh, that pest management is done uh, in affordable housing today, and, and we really need to move towards these assessment-based programs, at least in communities that are suffering from high infestation rates. Okay, so I think when it comes to bed bugs, um, if there's one thing that, that everyone will agree on, uh, certainly among all the bed bug experts, it's that uh, early detection of bed bugs is critical because the longer an infestation goes undetected, the more complex the problems become, the more difficult and costly they are to eliminate, and the more likely these problems are to spread to other units within um, the housing community, as well as out into society, where it affects you know, our, our public transportation, our um, dialysis centers, our office buildings, our schools, and, and the rest of society. Um, and so really, uh, it's all these infestations that we're not aware of uh, that are promoting the failure of community-wide control efforts and the escalation of costs, because we know that um, the cost associated with bed bugs is very, very high. Which brings us to um, the first poll question that we asked, which had to do with how you go about identifying uh, bed bugs. And 48% of, of you said, uh, that you rely on residents to report activity, and another 48% said that, that they're taking a, a proactive approach, um, which I really applaud because uh, the majority of communities, um, you know, certainly uh, historically have relied upon residents to report activity. 
And this is really um, a major problem because our research uh, tells us that fewer than one third of all existing infestations are gonna be reported by residents. And this data comes from over 2000 apartments that were surveyed in uh, a number of different communities throughout New Jersey. And we see the same kinds of results being replicated throughout the country uh, by other researchers as well. And so the, the point is, is that if you don't know where over two thirds of all the infestations are, then it's virtually impossible to stop the spread of bed bugs in a community, no matter how much money you throw at it, and no matter what the quality of the pest management program is in the units that are being treated. So in these communities that experience chronic or high infestation rates, it's, it's really important that we have proactive methods for um, identifying bed bug activity and not relying on the residents. So why is it that so many of these infestations go unreported? There's, you know, I'm just going to offer a few possibilities, but there's many, many reasons that residents fail to report problems. Um, one is that they often become apathetic. Um, you know, they've been in a situation where they've been suffering from pest infestations that never seem to get resolved. And after a while, they simply don't want to be bothered anymore. And they learn to live with the problem and try treating it on their own rather than reporting the problem. Um, in other cases, they may fear negative repercussions from property management. So if, if property management isn't taking a very positive and proactive approach with the residents, residents are not likely to report the problems. Um, and I'll, I'll get to this much later in the presentation, but they, they may also be fearing uh, the negative uh, consequences of having to prepare their apartments for bed bugs because when treatments are done, very often residents are asked to discard uh, infested items or go through very lengthy preparations. And many of these residents would rather not report the problem because they don't wanna be forced to do these types of things. Sometimes they're trying to avoid attention from management and maybe there's activities going on in their apartment that they don't want anyone to know about. And then other times they're just ashamed or embarrassed. And, and we see this uh, most commonly in uh, housing for seniors where they remember the stigma from when they were young children and they just don't want anyone to know about the fact that they have bed bugs. And then of course there's times when the resident simply isn't aware that they have bed bugs because they're not seeing them or they may not be developing bite symptoms. We know among the elderly uh, about 60 percent, 50 to 60 percent of all of elderly uh, senior citizens who are being bitten by bed bugs never develop bite symptoms. So if you're eyesight is failing and you're not developing bite symptoms and, and these insects are very cryptic and secretive to begin with, uh, it's very difficult to even know that they're present. And then there are others who are, are suffering from either some type of a mental disability or diminishing mental capacities, and they may not even be able to recognize the problem or be in a position to report it as well. So, you know, there's many, many reasons, and these are just a few, uh, why residents aren't going to report the problem. And this is why uh, we see such low uh, reporting rates of, you know, only maybe one third or, or fewer of infestations being identified to uh, property management. So if we can't rely on the residents to report the problem, what methods can we use to detect them? Uh, there, the three probably most common methods would be visual inspection, uh, monitors or traps, and the use of scent detection dogs, the canine, uh, canine scent dogs. And all of these vary in their effectiveness. Uh, which brings us to the second question that we had asked, which is what methods are you currently using? And about 61% of you, so more than half, um, indicated that you rely on visual inspections to identify bed bug activity. Um, and then there was a, a mixture among the other options. Well, when we look at the pest management industry, historically, um, Virtually the entire pest management industry relies on visual inspections or utilizes visual inspection to identify bed bug activity, uh, while only about half use other methods of detection, things like pitfall traps, um, underneath the legs of beds of furniture. We see 44% using sticky traps, which is um, really alarming. Uh, because sticky traps are not known to be an effective tool for, for detecting bed bugs. So while you may catch a bed bug on a sticky trap, it is not in any way a reliable detection method. So the fact that there's so many people in the industry, in the pest management industry, that utilize these is of concern. Uh, 
And then, you know, about 42% using bed bug sniffing dogs. So the majority of people are in fact relying on visual inspection, and that's perfectly fine uh, when we have well-established or heavy infestations. Uh, infestations like you're seeing on this slide here uh, can be easily detected through visual inspection. There's no need to be spending money on expensive uh, detection methods like traps or, or canine scent dogs to identify something like this. But we know from our research that most infestations are not severe. In fact, uh, oh, from thousands of apartments that we've looked at, there are only 10% uh, of all infestations are gonna be of severe nature. And the vast majority of them are gonna be either moderate or low level, with the majority of those being low level infestations. So typically about 65 to 75% of all infestations are gonna be very low level infestations. And we also know that many of these low level and even some of these moderate level infestations are gonna be missed during a visual inspection. So what that indicates then is that the majority of at least you know, 50 plus percent of um, infestations could easily be missed during a visual inspection. And it all depends on how extensive that inspection is as well, whether it's a quick inspection or whether the um, furniture is actually being broken down. So of all of the um, methods that we've tested uh, at Rutgers, installation of pitfall style interceptor traps like the climb up interceptor that you see on the left or the blackout that you see in the picture on the right, um, these have been the most effective tools for detecting low level bed bug activity. So if you're not familiar with these traps, they, they look like um, ashtrays in a way. Um, they're placed underneath the legs of the bed and they're very slippery. So the way a pitfall trap works is as a bug um, climbs into the trap, it gets trapped in the slippery well and is unable to escape. Um, so these, um, by, being, by placing them underneath the legs of the bed, they can capture bugs that are leaving the bed or traveling to the bed. And they've proven to be very, very reliable for detection of low level populations. In fact, the most reliable tool out there. Uh, we've also done extensive research on these devices and found that they are very effective for detecting bed bugs, even when they're not underneath the legs of furniture. So just by being placed around the apartment um, along the wall floor junction, and I'll introduce some of that research later. So just to give you an example, uh, we compared uh, resident interview, visual inspection, and use of interceptor traps in a uh, large affordable housing community for the elderly. Uh, so this was uh, 358 apartments housing both elderly as well as disabled residents. And uh, there were 71 infested apartments that had been identified. Uh, and these infestations varied in uh, severity from low level all the way to severe. So these were mixed levels of infestations. And when we visited each of these apartments and we asked each resident if they were aware of an infestation in their apartment, only 30% of the 71 infested units were identified through resident interview, which is very comparable to what we might find when uh, we're relying on residents to report activity. Um, if we did a visual inspection, and these were thorough vis visual inspections, these were uh, two researchers and we were um, removing, uh, removing beds and, and looking thoroughly, 69% of the infestations were identified through visual inspection. Conversely, when we put um, pitfall traps underneath the legs of the beds and upholstered furniture and came back two weeks later to check the uh, devices, we detected 96% of all the infestations. So that's all but three of the 71 infestations were identified uh, by the pitfall traps underneath the legs of the furniture. So you can see how effective these, uh, these devices are detecting bed bugs. Um, we, um, we know also though, however, that the visual inspection is less effective when we're looking strictly at low level population. So if we were to take 77 apartments that had uh, 10 or fewer bed bugs present during the initial inspection, we see that the uh, visual inspection uh, results drop from the previous 69% down to just about 52%. And we see that the interceptors continue to detect over 90% of the infestations. So again, you can see that um, 
as infestations become lower and lower in number uh, or lower in severity, the effectiveness of the visual inspection is going to decline, but these are the interceptors continues to remain high. We also evaluate the ability of bedbug sniffing dogs to detect bedbugs. And what we found is that there's a tremendous degree of variability among uh, the teams that exist. We, we looked at 11 different teams and we evaluated them in three different experiments, inspecting a total of 276 apartments. 67, 67 of those 276 apartments had bedbug activity, but the mean detection rate for the dogs was only 44%. And you can see the range of effectiveness was anything from as low as 10% detection to no higher than 80%. Um, but the majority of these uh, inspection teams were operating around the 50% mark. And the same thing with false positives is we had a high false positive rate. So false positive is when dogs are uh, indicating on the presence of bed bugs when bed bugs in fact don't exist. And here we have a, a false positive rate of 14% with, again, a very wide range. Uh, some dogs had no false positives and others had as many as 57%, which you can see would be a, a huge problem if you have, you know, 14% or more of the indications not actually being bed bugs. That's a, that's a lot of alarm uh, with residents and it's a lot of expense to treat apartments that didn't need to be treated. Um, again, in comparison to the canine scent detection teams, the interceptors were detecting at a 90% detection rate. So typically with interceptors uh, over a two week period, we can uh, typically count on 90% and above detection. Okay, so that brings us to the, uh, the next question, uh, the next two questions actually that we asked. Um, and these had to do with what rooms are you treating when you do identify bed bugs? And how likely are these bed bugs to be traveling away from beds and sofas? And uh, again, encouragingly, 71% of you uh, indicated that when you're treating apartments, you're treating the entire apartment, not, not just the sleeping or resting areas. Um, so for those of you that didn't answer that way, we'll, we'll discuss why that, um, why it's so important that we, we do whole apartment treatments and not just focus on an individual room. And for the second question, how likely are bed bugs to travel away from beds and sofas? And we're talking about traveling significantly far away. We used examples like kitchens and bathrooms, um, nowhere's even close to the sleeping and resting area. We had a 50-50 response. Um, so uh, half, half of you believe that they stay at the sleeping area and half of you believe that they travel. So let's take a, a little look at, a, a bit of a look at this. Um, Unfortunately, you know, treatments um, are sometimes limited to just the bedroom and the living room where people are sleeping, or in some cases, even worse, uh, these treatments can be limited to just where people say they've actually seen the bugs. Uh, so the reason for this is that uh, based on the classic distribution model, which is what we're looking at in this pie chart, uh, the majority of bed bugs are in fact associated at the sleeping and resting areas, beds and upholstered furniture. And a very, very small percentage are located away from the beds. Uh, you have to realize though, when we're looking at these models, they're actually kind of uh, skewed or biased because this is based on the number of bugs that we're able to find in certain areas based on a visual inspection. And uh, if you're looking at uh, an area like a bed or, or a piece of furniture, it's actually very easy to spot the bed bugs there, but it's a lot less, um, it's, it's much more difficult to identify bed bugs if they're under baseboards or hiding in unpredictable locations. So it makes sense that we would be able to find most of the bed bugs at the beds in the sleeping areas. Um, so when we look at what we found through our research, we find that bed bug movement within apartments is a lot different than what we actually have historically believed. And I'd like to use uh, a, a case study of an apartment to try and illustrate um, how bed bugs are actually moving in apartments or where they're moving in apartments. Uh, we've spent a, a number of years studying the movement of bed bugs within apartments as well as between apartments. And, uh, and what we found is really kind of surprising. So in this particular unit, uh, this was a severely infested unit. And uh, I'm using the, a severely infested unit because it's just easier to illustrate 
uh, and, and really kind of demonstrate the kind of movement when we have large numbers of bed bugs to work with. But I want to stress that you can find the same kind of movement that I'm going to show you in lower level infestations as well. So um, as, you would, as you might think, if you were to place interceptors underneath the legs of the bed, so these little white double circles that you see in the bedroom at the bed, uh, we, we collected over a two week period, 109 bed bugs in the four interceptor devices. However, um, if we were to have also placed interceptors uh, along the, the uh, base of the walls throughout the bedroom, over that same two week period, we collected more than twice as many bed bugs as we did at the bed. And you can see again, that the numbers uh, that are at each one of these interceptor devices show the number of bed bugs caught at each one of those locations. Now, if we expand the use of the interceptor devices throughout the entire apartment, and if you notice in the living room, uh, this, this individual was uh, wheelchair bound and had no uh, upholstered furniture in the living room, so no, uh, no sofas or uh, recliners or anything of that nature. So really the uh, bedroom was really the only sleeping area. And if we expand this, what you'll find is that there were 587 bed bugs captured throughout the remainder of the apartment, with 88% of them being captured in areas that were well away from the bed. Areas like the bathroom, oh, let me back up. Areas like the bathroom, there were 78 bed bugs caught in the bathroom, 21 caught in the kitchen, 45 caught by either side of the entry door to the apartment, which again, I'll show you um, why that might be in just a few moments. And you can see large numbers caught in the hallway as well. So the fact of the matter is, is that bed bugs are much more mobile than uh, we've ever believed in the past. And as a result of this, um, they travel very far from the host sleeping and resting area. So it's imperative that when we're doing treatments that they're not limited to just the areas where people sleep. Okay, so um, once you identify apartments with activity, uh, clearly we, we obviously have to treat these apartments. And so uh, the next polling questions uh, dealt with uh, getting ready for those treatments. And questions five and six were, um, what kind of resident preparation is required prior to treatment? And the reason we ask this is, you know, I, you know, we all know and have been told that proper preparation is absolutely essential. And 87% of you would have agreed with that because 87% responded that you require preparations prior to treatment. And I guess the question I want to ask is, is it really necessary? So um, often the kinds of preparations that we're requiring uh, from the pest management industry to these residents, I, in my opinion, are, are overburdensome and they're often unrealistic. Uh, so this is one of my favorite quotes that came from a uh, pest management website. And it says, um, I'll just read it out loud. Uh, it says, be ready for some very serious, exhausting, detailed, hard work, exclamation point. Get a friend or friends to help you if possible, because the amount of preparation can sometimes be mind boggling. Do it right the first time. Do the necessary hard work. You can't skimp when it comes to preparing for bed bug treatment. So what kind of things are we asking these residents to do? Well, we're asking them to do a lot. Uh, and this is just a few of them. Uh, very often they're asked to, to strip the bed linens from their bed, uh, to remove the mattresses and box springs and stand them up on end. They're asked to remove and bag any items that might be underneath their beds or underneath or on their upholstered furniture. They're asked to remove everything from all their dressers and all their closets and to uh, bag and launder everything, including their personal items. Uh, they're often asked to remove all the wall hangings, the pictures, the clocks, and anything else that might be attached to the wall. They're asked to remove their draperies, bag and launder them. And this is just a few of the items. The list just keeps going and going and going. And so this is where, you know, I ask everyone to take what I would call the mirror test and look into a mirror and ask yourself, would I be able to do the things that I'm asking my residents to do? Or for, if you're in the pest control industry, the things that you're asking your clients to do. And 
from a personal perspective, I can't even imagine what would be involved in trying to do all these things in my own home. And not only the, the amount of time and effort and labor, but the cost that's associated with it as well. Um, and to make matters worse, uh, you know, what ends up happening is everybody gets the same prep list regardless. We all know that every infestation is unique. So the question is, why aren't the prep lists unique as well? So if you look at the slides on the left, we're, we're showing uh, an inspection that's revealing a single bed bug. And if we look at the pictures on the right, we're looking at grossly infested in a grossly infested apartment. Uh, but yet, both of these individuals are going to receive the same exhaustive prep list, which to me just makes no sense. So really, these prep lists shouldn't be one size fits all. Um, you shouldn't have the same prep list for a recent introduction of one or two bug, bed bugs as you do for a well-established infestation or an isolated infestation versus a, a highly dispersed infestation. And the reality is that you know many of these preparations that we're asking them to do and, and prior to treatment, which is the key here, we're asking them to do, do these things before we come in to treat are either unnecessary or can actually further complicate the problem and do more harm than good. Because a lot of these activities actually disrupt the infestation, they alter the conditions, they promote dispersal of bed bugs, and a lot of these items that are infested are not being properly addressed by the resident and can further complicate control. So for example, do we really want residents stripping all the bed linens off of beds like this, these? Um, and do we want them removing the mattresses and the box springs and, and then, you know, leaning them up against the wall? Uh, or what about a situation items underneath beds? Uh, the reality is that many times when you have items underneath the area where the resident is sleeping, these items are very highly prone to infestation. So, for example, uh, we see uh, eggs and, and bed bugs and skins and whatnot on these on these boots and these sneakers. So this is really common, but these kinds of things can't be laundered by the resident. And the question is, is the resident going to do the correct things to uh, address these bed bugs or what's going to happen to them? Well, typically we're asking them to throw these into bags, which I don't necessarily think is a good idea. Um, often when we have these bagged items, they're, they're not uh, sealed correctly or they're ripped or they're torn. Um, so, you know, the reality is that we, we want them using heavy duty bags, industrial bags, but these are very expensive. So the reality is that very often they're not using these heavy duty bags or they're using very cheap inexpensive bags. Uh, we want them to use bags that aren't gonna tear. Uh, we want them to keep them tightly sealed. In many cases, we're asking them to keep the bags sealed for six months or more so that we can starve the bugs, but they're not gonna do this. They, they often they open them because they need to get some clothes out or find a child's toy. Um, because after all, all these personal items that we're asking them to put in the bags are, are things that they need to live with and they need to access them. And so what happens if these items that are placed in these bags are infested and uh, for a period of time and then the bags become compromised and we have bugs coming back out? And so you can see how bagging a lot of infested items uh, you know, may not be the most effective idea. So then the question is, is, what happens when residents fail to follow these preps? And unfortunately, the answer is all too often, what that means is we're not gonna treat. So here's another uh, one of my favorite quotes, uh, again, from a pest management website, where basically it says, we understand that appropriate preparation can be difficult to achieve in a short period of time, and that senior citizens or handicapped individuals may have difficulty carrying out the necessary preparations. Please note, we will not provide treatment to any unit or property that has not met the preparations. And what really kind of floors me here is they acknowledge the fact that seniors and handicapped individuals are not likely to be able to readily carry out these preparations. And if we go back to the mirror test, you know, the average individual can't really carry out these preparations either. So when these preparations are not carried out, uh, to our satisfaction, our response is, well, we can't properly treat the apartment because it wasn't properly prepared, and therefore our treatments are going to fail. And, you know, again, when you think about the most 
affected community, the most affected community is in fact our seniors and our disabled residents. And so it's not really fair or realistic to ask them to do this. So, you know, how is it okay? How does it help? What does it accomplish? You know, these are all some very serious questions I think we need to ask ourselves and ask ourselves, why are we doing this? So what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is a no prep approach. And this is a concept that is very, very slowly beginning to gain traction within the industry. Um, unfortunately, at the present time, there's not very many pest management companies that offer this type of approach. And, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a radically different kind of concept, but it, it really makes sense and it fits very nicely into the whole assessment based philosophy. Because the no prep approach allows you to go in in an undisturbed environment and assess the true nature of an infestation before it's been altered and before it's been disrupted. It allows you then to make site specific recommendations following the initial service. And here's the key, it's following the initial service, not prior to the initial service, okay? So once we know what is needed, we can make very specific recommendations uh, on things that need to be done in, in, in specific infested areas. We can identify obstacles to control. And so really what's important here to understand is that no prep should not be confused with no cooperation. We're not, we're not saying that you don't require client cooperation in order to resolve bed bugs, but what we're saying is that that cooperation is best asked once we've identified and assessed the, the infestation and treated it, than it is to have them do a bunch of things that may or may not be necessary that may further complicate the problem before we've even gone in to do an initial service. So instead, what it means is that we're limiting our requests uh, to things that we know have been positively identified as interfering with our ability to eliminate the infestation. And we're much more likely to get uh, cooperation when we're making reasonable requests when, versus when we're making broad blanketed requests. And we know uh, from our research that even though this concept is new to the industry, uh, we know that it works. This is, this is something that's been around for over 15 years. I can speak personally from uh, my own company's perspective that we've done no prep since the early 2000s, um, really since we began treating bed bugs. And we've now treated hundreds and hundreds of apartments in our research at Rutgers University um, in, you know, in the field, in the real world, and had success with the no prep approach. Um, so the reason I show the, the cartoon of the person on the crutch is that I think that really um, leaning on preparations is really nothing more than a crutch. Um, and, and it's a real easy way for us to say that the reason we didn't solve the problem was that the resident didn't prepare, or the reason that we couldn't treat the apartment was because it was too complex to treat. And the reality is that we really need to go into the conditions unless they're just so deplorable and do the best that we can to get the problem under control and then start identifying and addressing the obstacles and challenges that we face. Okay, which brings us then to the actual treatment of the apartment. And the question uh, talked about what types of methods are being used. And again, I, I'm seeing a nice shift in the uh, trend, at least of the people that are attending this webinar that uh, just about half of you, a little over half of you, 56%, said that you rely on both a combination of pesticides as well as non-chemical control methods, which is, again, very encouraging because when the pest management uh, industry was surveyed back in 2015, 96% um, of them responded that they use pesticides, while you can see much uh, lower percentages use non-chemical measures such as vacuum, steam, or heat. Um, I think <clears throat> the big take home here is that relying on pesticides for control is a, is a big mistake. Um, and we know going back uh, quite a ways that, that bed bugs are highly resistant to many of our modern day pesticides. Uh, there was a study back in 2013 where they uh, demonstrated that 88% of field tested uh, bed bug populations were highly resistant to commonly used pesticides. And this was 
uh, almost 100 different populations that were tested from all over the United States. We also know that bed bugs possess multiple mechanisms of resistance, and this is another uh, research report that came out in 2013, which demonstrated that 71% of all of the populations tested possessed five if up to five different mechanisms of resistance. So what does that mean? What it means is that they are able to uh, tolerate and resist the effects of pesticides from a number of different angles. And what that, what that ultimately means is that uh, they're going to be resistant to just about any kind of chemical or, or can quickly develop resistance to just about any kind of chemical that we can throw at them. And so for this reason, we don't want to rely on chemicals alone because we're likely to come up against some populations that this is just gonna be ineffective. Fortunately, we have a lot of uh, non-chemical methods that happen to be very effective. For example, mattress and box spring encasements. Um, and I saw that uh, a lot of people aren't using these, but this was one of the first non-chemical tools that came out that really kind of uh, changed uh, bed bug management and um, is seemingly uh, not as popular as it once was, but um, I think is a critical component to bed bug management. Um, these devices, uh, these encasements can be used both proactively as well as reactively. Uh, proactively, they can be used to uh, detect bed bugs early. Uh, beds that are encased uh, are much easier to inspect because the bugs are restricted to the uh, smooth exterior of the encasements versus being able to get into the nooks and crannies and inside of the box spring where they're much more difficult to detect. They can be used to protect um, replacement beds. Sometimes people uh, insist on throwing beds away. And if they are going to throw their beds away and they're going to bring new beds into an infested dwelling, then those new beds are going to become infested. So encasing can help protect those replacement beds <clears throat> from becoming infested. In many cases, people don't want to throw their beds away, nor do they need to throw their beds away. Um, so we can remove as many bugs as possible from the beds and then encase the mattress in a box spring and salvage these infested beds and, and leave them in place. And then they also, the encasements also improve efficiencies during our follow-up services, just making uh, inspection and treatment of beds as new bugs migrate to the sleeping areas much more efficient. <clears throat> the inner are another uh, tool. Uh, earlier, I talked about them for as a tool for detecting bed bugs, but there's also been a lot of research that has shown that interception devices can also be used uh, to make a, a significant impact on the population by reducing numbers and actually contributing to control, especially when we're talking about low-level populations. Uh, we, there have been studies done showing that uh, using interceptors throughout entire apartments, uh, mass trapping, can actually be uh, a control tool unto itself in very low level populations. So the use of interceptors underneath legs, beds and furniture uh, can, use, can be used to intercept uh, bugs that are traveling to and from the resting areas. Uh, the, so the interceptors also, um, you know, by placing these interceptors underneath the beds, you can also intercept bugs that are trying to disperse off the beds and lay eggs away from the sleeping and resting areas. So they play a valuable role in a number of different ways. And then when they're placed away from the sleeping and resting areas, um, they can be used very effectively to intercept bed bugs that are traveling through the apartment. Remember, uh, these bugs are very mobile. They're moving everywhere. And so by putting interceptors in other areas away from the beds, we're able to uh, understand where bed bugs are active. It can help in determining if bed bugs are still present. It can also help in evaluating areas that might need uh, more thorough inspection and or treatment. There's uh, some newer uh, interceptor devices that have come onto the market in the past year or so. Um, and the, uh, many of you may be familiar with the volcano. Uh, which is a very small discrete trap. And then there's the active volcano. Uh, the active just means that it has an active lure placed in it, which is a, a chemical-based lure. And so the picture on the top is showing an example of uh, a volcano that has an, a lure packet in it. And the one on the bottom also has a lure packet on it. It's just showing you how easy they are to inspect. So these are much smaller, more discrete than the larger round interceptors. They're not intended to be placed underneath the bed. Uh, they don't require the labor that's involved with the under the leg interceptors. 
Uh, they're very easy to inspect and they require very little maintenance. So because of the, um, the labor efficiencies and savings, these are becoming um, increasingly popular. Um, <clears throat> other methods that can be used are the physical destruction of bugs and eggs through the use of vacuums or steam. Uh, vacuums can be used very effectively to eliminate large numbers of bed bugs. Um, obviously, we don't want to be chasing individual bed bugs around, but when we come across large aggregations of bed bugs, uh, vacuums are very efficient at removing those bugs from the environment. So it's much better to, to know that the bugs are physically gone than to treat these areas with pesticide that may or may not work. Uh, vacuums do have some limitations. Um, because they're not the best at removing eggs. The eggs are, are glued tightly to the substrate. And so while vacuums might remove some of the eggs, they don't always remove all of them. And so there are other tools uh, that can be used very effectively to overcome that. Um, before I go to that, though, one other thing I want to point out about vacuums <clears throat> are that by vacuuming areas where bugs exist, uh, you're removing a lot of the evidence also. Because when we're coming on follow-up inspections, we don't want to be looking at, at dead bugs and carcasses that were there. And the carcasses uh, play another very important role because the first stage bed bug nymphs, the very, very tiny bed bug nymphs that are only about a millimeter in size, they love to hide inside the shed skins of bed bugs. So physically removing the shed skins becomes very, very important um, because it's not just the skins that you're removing, but you're removing lots and lots of these first first stage bed bug nymphs, uh, which while inside of these shed skins are very often protected from <clears throat> pesticides that are being applied. Okay, um, I mentioned that steam is a, a great alternative uh, and overcomes <clears throat> some of the limitations of vacuums. Uh, the reason that steam is effective is that not only does it destroy all the uh, stages, including the eggs that aren't removed by the vacuum, but it also has penetrating power. So steam will penetrate um, cracks uh, that bed bugs are hiding in. It can also penetrate upholstery, uh, getting uh, through uh, the pleats in the fold that bed bugs are hiding under. So steam is one of the more effective tools for treating upholstered furniture. Um, you do have to be careful with some type of leather where it, and then of course, you know, we get into much more complicated situations uh, where we have to uh, start to inspect um, or start to deal with items that are, are not as easily dealt with. A lot of the people's personal belongings and personal items, like you see in these various pictures. Um, so one of the things that we can do here, and you know, this is where we're probably going to start to need some cooperation from the resident, but uh, we can begin to sort these items into different categories. Um, for example, um, we can go, you know, working with the resident and identify what items no longer care to keep, and those items can be bagged. What items can be laundered, and they can be bagged for laundering. Um, and then the items that can't be laundered, uh, there are some other possible uh, solutions for those, such as placing them into a portable heat chamber, or if the resident doesn't mind, possibly into a household freezer for uh, four days or so. And in some communities, we've seen where they actually uh, purchase a large coffin freezer that is being utilized to uh, freeze personal belongings and then return them to residents. We also have communities that purchase portable heat boxes so that they can make them available uh, to residents when we have some of these items that can't be laundered and we don't want to throw them away. We also need to recognize that sometimes our residents are going to need some help. Um, I think it's unrealistic to say that a resident has to be completely responsible when they're, when they're physically or mentally disabled and they just simply don't have the ability to help themselves and they don't have family members that can help. So some of the, the practices that um, we've utilized in communities that we've worked in uh, have been where property management has helped subsidize the cost of laundering uh, for uh, residents who were suffering from bed bug infestations to try and promote the uh, likelihood that these items are going to be laundered because this is expensive for residents. And if it's being subsidized, especially uh, if there are um, washers and dryers that take tokens, then that works out really well because they're not going to be using the money for something else. 
uh, sorting through infested items for residents who don't have the ability to do it themselves. And then even in some situations, we've had uh, beds on beds that are directly on the floor because the person doesn't have a bed frame. Um, we've had property managers who have supplied bed frames to people who simply cannot or will not get their beds off the floor uh, because getting that bed up onto a very inexpensive, simple metal bed frame can save a lot of money in the long run uh, because this is a very, very difficult obstacle to overcome. And a simple bed frame is, a, is an inexpensive solution which can prevent a lot of unnecessary follow-up visits. So then we have pesticides, which we started out with. And it's not to say that pesticides don't have any place in bed bug management, they certainly do. Um, but they're really best used as the last line of defense rather than the uh, primary method of control. So it's all these other methods that we're looking at, things like encasements and vacuums and steam and heat boxes and, and things of this nature, interceptors. Uh, those are the bulk of the program. And then pesticides are the last line of defense. And then, of course, you want to try and stay up to date with the latest research as to what pesticides are working the most effectively. Okay, so this brings us to um, the next two polling questions that we had asked. Uh, one, question seven, uh, asks about how many times uh, do you service apartments for bed bugs? And question eight, how do you know if an infestation is eliminated? And the majority, um, well, I would say it was about 58% of you uh, indicated that you service the apartments as many times as necessary, but there were also quite a few of you that said two to three times is what is needed. And then um, the majority of you, 81%, uh, said that the way you know an infestation is eliminated is it's a, it's a combination of the resident no longer seeing bed bugs and bed bugs not being seen during a visual or during an inspection. Um, and I think it's important that we identify what type of inspection is you're gonna see in these upcoming slides. So think about, um, what processes you use for determining when an apartment's eliminated or when an infestation has been eliminated. Uh, what type of inspection methods are you relying on? So <clears throat> again, when the pest management industry was, was polled, um, the majority of pest management professionals um, had programs that literally had one to three visits and then the program was done, uh, where very few uh, pest management professionals, only 15% believed that uh, it takes you know three or more visits to solve bed bug problems. And again, from our research, and you know this should be no surprise, uh, we know that if you're dealing with a, a newly introduced infestation and one that's low level, uh, most of these can in fact be resolved in just a couple of visits. Um, although I will mention that just because a, an infestation is low level doesn't necessarily mean that it's always easy to control. So you could have low level infestations that take more than a couple of visits to resolve. Um, and uh, conversely, we know that uh, when we're dealing with severe, especially these chronic infestations that have been treated over and over and over um, and are, have been treated ineffectively, you know, in other words, reducing problems but not eliminating them. Uh, some of these can be a real challenge to control, and, and they could take up to five visits or, or more. So it is important that we um, have as many follow-ups as necessary. Uh, we don't want to have predetermined number of follow-ups, but in fact, we do want to continue to follow up until that problem is eliminated, which then raises uh, the, the, the next poll question, which was, you know, how do you know if it's eliminated? And uh, the fact is that confirming elimination is even more difficult than detecting bed bugs in the first place because when we're at the terminal end of a, a treatment effort, um, there's very, very few bed bugs left and most of the bugs are in unpredictable locations. And so it's hard to detect these bed bugs, especially uh, when we're relying on visual inspection alone. So just because you're not finding them doesn't mean they're not there. And um, I wanna, uh, go through a little bit more research and show you what I mean. So we did um, quite a bit of work looking at bed bug distributions within apartments and where bed bugs were being found. And what we found is that when we uh, surveyed apartments before any treatments had been done, so this is when the infestation was first identified, we found that um, more than half of the bed bugs were found in areas away from sleeping and resting areas. Uh, so that's 63%. And this goes back to why I said that classic distribution model doesn't work, 
where it was believed that 90% or more of bed bugs are, are present at sleeping and resting areas. The fact is that, that over half of them are, are found in areas off of the bed. But these are in apartments that have not been treated yet. If we then look at apartments that are in the process of being treated, we see that there's a major shift that the number found away from the bed in the gray goes up even higher. So 83% of all the bed bugs that are being found in these apartments during the treatment process, um, you know, this is during the, the follow-up visits, are being found in areas not associated with sleeping and resting areas. And if you think about that, it, it makes a lot of sense because the sleeping resting areas, areas like the beds, <clears throat> they're being encased, they're being vacuumed, uh, upholstered furniture is being steamed, treatments are being made. So it's very difficult for bed bugs to continue to survive in those environments. And so what the bed bugs that are left are often found in other places, you know, throughout the apartment in, in highly unpredictable locations, making them very hard to find. So let's go back to a short little case study here involving five apartments to try and illustrate this. In these five apartments, these were apartments that were being treated for bed bugs. And if we went into these five apartments and we did a, a visual inspection, a pretty comprehensive one, a 20 minute inspection, this involves, you know, lifting and removing the mattress and the box spring, flipping over the beds or the beds and the upholstered furniture. So it's a reasonably thorough inspection. And in this case, you see number apartment number four, there was a single bed bug found. So based upon these results, we could conclude that the other four apartments, bed bugs have been eliminated because we're not able to find the presence of bed bugs any longer. Now, if we had taken these same five apartments and we had placed interceptors underneath the legs of the beds, you would see that actually three, three of the five apartments have bed bugs. So there are two, apartments number one and apartments number three, that had bed bugs that were not detected through visual inspection alone. But what's really interesting is if we had placed interceptors throughout the entire apartment, which is something that is rarely done, we would find that all five of these apartments actually still had bed bugs. And you can see by the size of the bars, the yellow bars where we're looking at the interceptors away from the beds and furniture, that we're, we're catching much larger numbers of bed bugs away from the beds than we are at the beds which corroborates the, the data that I showed you in the pie charts, is that when we're at the terminal end of an infestation, the majority of the bed bugs that are still left are being found in areas away from sleeping and resting areas and are much more difficult to detect. So I think the, the take home point here is that um, had we just been relying on visual inspection, we would have determined that four of these five apartments didn't have bed bugs when in fact all five still have the bed bug problem. And if we're prematurely terminating our treatment efforts, then it's only gonna be a matter of time before these populations build back up. And this again promotes spread. So we wanted to see just you know, how, um, how often this occurred in units that were considered terminated. And we, we did a much larger study. And what we found was that 64% of the apartments um, that were believed to have been resolved and treatment had been terminated, 64% of those apartments still had activity after the bugs were believed to be, to be gone. And among those apartments, and this was a total of actually 64 apartments that we looked at, um, among those 64 apartments, 54% of the time, the only bugs that were detected were detected away from sleeping areas, which would, you know, again, uh, help you understand why they weren't detected in the first place. And then another thing that we found, which was also um, something that was a little bit more surprising was that the activity was not detected during every trapping interval. So in other words, if we went in and we uh, inspected our interceptor traps throughout these apartments on one visit and found no bed bugs, we, we would come back two weeks later and we might find activity that, that next visit. So what we, what we determined through a lot of research was that it took three consecutive visits, two weeks apart. So basically a six, a six week trapping interval with zero bed bug activity to have a very high level of confidence. It was about a 91% uh, degree confidence that the infestation was in fact gone. And this is something that we've used in our research 
as a, quote, elimination protocol. Okay, so um, in addition to treating the apartment and making sure that the problems are resolved, uh, we also have to be concerned about the neighboring apartments. And so the next question uh, has to do with, um, do you actually inspect the neighboring uh, units in addition to the one that's being treated? So we did some research, um, and I, let me see if I have the results for that. 79% of you said you do treat the neighboring apartments. We had done some mark release recapture work. Uh, if you're not familiar with this kind of study, it's where we go in, we capture a large number of bed bugs in an apartment, we mark them, and we actually release them back into the apartment. There's all kinds of uh, approvals that you need to do this from uh, an ethical standpoint, which I'm not going to get into today, but we were working with individuals who were not being affected negatively by bed bugs and agreed to participate in the study. And um, we looked at six different apartments in the study. Four of them were occupied and two of them were vacant. And what we found is when we released uh, bed bugs back into these apartments and uh, we released based on the color, you can see where they were released. So the green bugs were released in the living room, the yellow bugs in the bedroom, and the blue bugs were released in the bathroom of the infested unit in red. And what we found is that we had bugs of all colors moving in all directions going to all the neighboring apartments. Uh, so they moved, uh, this was the, the top story apartment, so they couldn't move up, but they did move to both sides. They moved beneath uh, to the unit below, and they also moved to the apartment across the hall. Uh, which is something that we uh, weren't quite expecting to see. Um, and they began moving as quickly as three days. So over a 14-day period, we captured 11 of our marked bugs, which is only representing a very small percentage of the population. There were, there were many, I'm sure, of unmarked bugs that were also doing the same. Um, and what was really fascinating is we had uh, sticky tape barriers um, in front of uh, the doors, and we found that um, there were 11 marked bed bugs found at the entry doors to these apartments and 269 unmarked bed bugs, which is giving you a much better idea of what the whole population is doing um, on these sticky barriers. So these were heavily infested apartments, but what it demonstrated is that um, the entry doors to apartments seem to be a major route of dispersal. And there are many, many more bed bugs going out the apartment door and down the hallway and into the neighboring apartments um, than we than we would have suspected. Uh, normally we're thinking they're traveling the pipes and the electrical lines and things of that nature, which I'm sure they do, but the uh, entry door seems to be a major route of dispersal. And so when we look at, um, when we look at how uh, infestations occur, we often find that they, they occur in clusters or bunches. So this was six different buildings over almost 1,100 apartments. And uh, among the infested ones, there were 29% of the, the number's not shown on this, this table, but 29% of the 1,100 or 1,078 1, apartments were actually infested. 72% of all of those infestations uh, had extended were, were in occurring in clumps. In other words, they were, they were uh, the infestation was in one unit as well as neighboring units, one or more of the neighboring units. And as you can see, um, you know, they, they move both adjacently, they move uh, vertically, but what was really surprising is 25% of the time we found these bed bugs in apartments that were actually across the hall from the infested unit. Um, so that's important because not only is it important that you're inspecting neighboring apartments for bed bugs, but it's also that important that you expand your definition of neighboring units to include those that are across the hall. Okay, so the next question was what tools and methods are used in your RFP? Um, and, uh, you know, there was a, a wide range of responses, but, you know, ultimately, what's important to understand is that if our RFPs are not written well, it's going to lead to uh, poor quality pest management. Uh, many of the RFPs don't um, require the use of effective tools and methods, and, and if they're not driving effective tools and methods, then you're, you can't expect um, the pest management industry to be bidding on those tools and methods because they're going to be bidding on the least expensive methods in order to win a low bid award. So it's critical that the RFP or the contract drives successful pest management. Um, so the end result is if we don't have a, a quality RFP, we're, we're, we're not likely to have a quality pest management plan, and this is gonna continue uh, to result in high infestation rate and spread. 
Um, so typical RFP language is, like I said, not geared towards success. For example, once complaints been made to the authority, the contractor will visually inspect the unit to verify an infestation. So the problems here are they're waiting for a complaint to be made and relying solely on visual inspection. Or apartments will be treated for bed bugs, and it doesn't really describe what treated means. So this could simply mean that we're going to come in and spray the apartment, which is, again is not likely to be effective. Or the bed bug treatment process must have two treatments for each, to each unit. So we're predefining the number of treatments that are necessary, which you know obviously there's no way of knowing how many treatments are going to be <clears throat> are going to be needed to resolve a problem. So a good contract really ought to include a request for uh, proactive inspections, um, should not rely on visual inspection alone, but should also include at least one other method. It doesn't have to be interceptors, but uh, at least one other method, whether it's interceptors and dogs, uh, but not visual inspection alone. Treatment should not be based, um, should be based on IPM, not pesticides alone, so multidisciplined approach. Um, the housing authority should define what its role is going to be, how are they going to support the, the process or the program when we have residents who are unable to cooperate? Um, are they going to step in? What kind of assistance are they going to provide? Uh, an effective method for determining when the bed bugs have been eliminated, so requiring some sort of elimination protocol. And a QA component to make sure that the services that are being delivered, you know, are in fact being take, are, are in fact being delivered, that, that there's accountability. Um, so moving forward, I think it's really important that there, there be good contract language, and I think this is the change that needs to happen in order to drive successful bed bug management. Um, and there is an, a model RFP that is available through Bed Bug Central. So um, these slides will be available after the webinar, so you can go on this website, and if you want to get a, at least a template that you can modify to your needs, uh, it is available. Okay, so to kind of try and wrap things up, I just want to walk you through um, taking these concepts and actually implementing them in the real world. Uh, so as part of an EPA grant, we implemented an assessment-based bed bug management program in a uh, community for senior and disabled residents. It was four high-rise buildings with very chronic pest problem. Um, they were spending quite a bit of money each year. And you can see that uh, since the problems began, if you look at the bar chart on the bottom right, uh, each year there was an escalating number of bed bug infestations that were being treated. So despite the fact that they were investing a large sum of money, uh, the infestation rates continued to climb. So we introduced a community-wide assessment and uh, based program in this community. We inspected the apartments uh, at what we're calling time zero, which is the initial inspection. Reinspected them again at six months and 12 months inspections. And this was all, again, part of a research project. Uh, the inspections consisted of um, asking residents if they had bed bugs, and then regardless of their answers, uh, placing interceptors underneath the legs of beds and furniture for two weeks, and then coming back. And if bed bugs were not found in the interceptors, doing visual inspections in those units. And what we found was again, um, corroborate some of the earlier research that I showed you, is that we identified 55 infestations. 71% of those 55 infestations <clears throat> had not been reported by residents. And 95% of all of those infestations were detected through the interceptors alone uh, rather than through visual. 45% were heavily infested because this was a chronically infested community and they had large numbers of bed bugs. Um, you compare this to when we went back at 6 and 12 months, and you can see that at 6 and 12 months, there were a total of 14 new infestations that had been introduced since the initial inspection. Again, 71% of them went unreported and would not have been uh, found as quickly if we hadn't done proactive inspections. All 14 were identified by interceptors, but here we see a change. 90% of these are low-level infestations, fewer than five bugs being detected. So we are now finding the infestations when they're just being introduced. Recent low-level infestations, which can be addressed much more efficiently, effectively, and affordably. Um, ultimately, in this program, we eliminated 96% <clears throat> of all the treated infestations. Um, there were still some infestations that were just recently treated as they were found towards the end of the program. That's why there's some remaining. Uh, we reduced the infestation rate from an initial uh, rate of 15% down to 2% within 12 months, and we used far less chemical compared to many of the other published studies that are out there uh, because we were relying mostly on non-chemical methods. 
Um, in, in a experimental setting, like a research project, but I want to also show you uh, similar kind of results in a commercial implementation, uh, where I was asked uh, back in 2010 to uh, work in an affordable housing community in New Jersey. Uh, again, senior and disabled living, uh, 360 apartments with a chronic and severe infestation, and they were spending a very large sum of money each year to treat the bed bugs. You can see that when we implemented the program, and it was a very similar program, we went in and we, we used interceptors, a combination of interceptors and visual inspection to identify infestations community-wide. And you can see initially we found 72 infested apartments the first year, um, and then those went into treatment, and you can see that the number uh, began to decline each year, and we're now down to about a uh, three, three or four percent infestation rate. Um, it's also important to recognize that once again, 29% or fewer of these infestations in any given year were reported by residents. So if a proactive inspection program had not been in place, the infestations would not have been identified and the infestation rates would not have been reduced. Um, looking at the number of infestations is one way to look at success, but again, I think looking at severity of infestations is also uh, very important. So if we look at what happened with severity of infestations, you see in the beginning, among the apartments that were infested, the majority of the infested apartments were moderate or high infestations, as denoted by the gray and the black bars. But by 2013, you can see that the green bars, which are the low-level infestations, uh, begin to remain high, and the gray and the black bars, the moderate and high infestations, become very low. So if you recall from the previous slide, we're not detecting very many infestations at this point in the later years. And not only are we not detecting a lot of infestations, but the, those that we are detecting are mostly low-level. And what this translates into is sustainable bed bug management, and reduce costs over time because these treatments, or these infestations that are, these few infestations that are being found can be treated um, much, much more effectively. So the majority of the costs are actually going into the monitoring and the proactive detection to maintain low infestation rates in these communities. And so you can see that the, uh, the cost savings over time can be dramatic uh, with you know, an initial investment that was a little bit more than what was actually being spent but then major cost savings over time as infestations are reduced and cost of treatment goes down. Um, before I conclude, and we're just gonna just about to wrap up here, um, I just wanna make a note that um, we don't wanna limit our thinking to just bed bugs, um, because really, you know, bed bugs might be the driver for community-wide, but we also have other major pests that we need to be concerned about, things like mice and rodents. And so this is a much more recent project that I worked on in a couple of different communities uh, in New Jersey. Again, um, the first community was a, a large high rise for senior and disabled residents. The second community had a combination both of uh, high rise for seniors as well as garden style family style apartments, which are a little bit more challenging to treat, but don't all, they also don't have the same kinds of infestation rates of bed bugs. So I'm just gonna show you a, um, the overall results for this to illustrate a few points. Um, when we went in and we did assessment-wide uh, inspections for these communities, what we see are very different results. So the blue color means that there's less than a 10% infestation rate, yellow is 11 to 20%, and red is greater than 20%. And if you look at the first community, uh, the top row, it's a 14-story high-rise for senior and disabled, we see that there was a 19% bed bug infestation rate, but they had a very uh, they had 37% roach infestations, but but 82%. Um, I'm sorry, these these are um, those are those are raw numbers. 19 apartments with bed bugs, 37 apartments with bed bugs, and 82 apartments with bed bugs. And the colors relate to uh, what the actual infestation rates were. Um, so you see that the red is greater than 20% of the building was infested with bed with uh, mice in this case. If we look at the second community. Uh, interestingly, it's in the same city. It's also a high rise for senior and disabled residents. So it's a very similar setting in close proximity to the other building. But here we see a very different story. Here we see 93 apartments. So the majority, their greater than 20% infestation rate had to do with their bed bugs. And they had much lower infestation rates for both the roaches and the mice. So you can begin to see how this assessment-based approach drives quality pest management because we know 
that these two communities require two different approaches. And we know where the, the um, resources need to be invested to bring the entire community under control and change the quality of life for the people living in that building. Now, if we look at the third community, uh, the garden style and community number two, uh, this is garden style, family style housing. And again, we see that the bed bugs are very low. Um, we don't get the same infestation rates typically in garden style as we do in high rises. Um, and that's because in garden style, you only have maybe six to 12 units in a building. So you've got all these buildings that are geographically separated. Um, so 300 units might be dispersed over many, many buildings where 300 units in a high rise, the bed bugs can go out the hall, out the door, down the hall, follow the vertical risers. And so there's a lot of dispersal that occurs in high rises that doesn't occur in the garden style communities and hence a very low infestation rate. Um, also not too bad with, with roaches, but where are the problems? The problems are with mice. And so again, uh, this helps us uh, you know, drive the resources where they need to be. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, it's been very difficult trying to get property managers to adopt this assessment-based approach. Um, I'm not sure of all the reasons. I think some of it is that, the, that property managers don't want to change. Um, we've always done it one way, and that's how we're going to continue to do it. It could be that ignorance is bliss. It could be that, you know, um, if our residents have a problem, they'll let us know, and they don't really want to know about all the apartments that have problems that aren't being reported. Um, because if I know that I have 70 infestations and not 12, I have to deal with that. Um, or it could be that there's some upfront costs that they're unwilling to spend in order to save money in the long run. And, um, you know, uh, ultimately, it's the property managers that, that need to embrace this concept in order for us to be able to roll this out throughout the nation. Um, so we need to do a better job of selling the concept, showing the examples of success stories, and showing, I think, ultimately return on investment, because that's ultimately what it's about. Um, so the keys to success, I would say, you know, certainly we don't want to rely on residents to report bed bugs. Um, if you have a community that has a 5% or greater infestation rate, I would suggest that in, in a specific building, I would suggest a building-wide inspection. If you're under 5%, um, maybe building-wide if you're close to the 5%, but as you get lower and lower, you're not going to get the same return on investment. So, so again, think of garden-style apartments. Uh, with a low infestation rate to, to do uh, community-wide in 30 buildings. Uh, when you have very low infestation rates, it, it might not um, make economic sense. Um, don't rely on visual inspection alone for detection. Don't rely on pesticides alone for treatment. Continue to follow up until problems are resolved and implement an effective elimination protocol. Inspect neighboring units, um, and including the ones across the hall. And um, if you have any questions, um, as Suzanne mentioned, uh, you can send questions to uh, Stop Pest. She's provided her uh, email, and I'll be happy to take any questions that we have time for. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have a couple questions we'll answer live. If you have to get off the webinar and can't hang with us, all these Q&A questions will be posted on my website. And um, if, Rick, you don't mind stopping your sh screen share, I will put up the contact. I'll give it another second, but I'll put up the stop pest contact. Okay, so I'm going to go through some questions. One that we got a couple times was um, freezing, about freezing. Is freezing effective? Um, I think we need to clarify uh, what kind of freezing we're talking about. There's really two kinds of freezing. Okay. Uh, one is placing things in a freezer. Um, the other is the rapid freeze technology, which is essentially the use of CO2 and applying um, rapid freeze to the insect itself. Um, we know that using a, a household freezer is effective for um, destroying bugs and eggs, but you really need to leave the items in the freezer for at least four days um, to get proper penetration. Um, as far as the rapid freeze technology goes, um, it is effective on contact. So the bugs that you hit um, will, will die from the rapid freeze, but there's a lot of skill and technique involved. And if it's not applied correctly, um, the bugs can recover or the bugs can be blown off of the treated surface. So uh, yes, it's an effective tool uh, for direct kill, but requires uh, a lot of technique. Okay, um, a couple questions on interceptors. Somebody asked how they work directly, and I'm going to answer that question private, 
shortly um, so we can get in a little more depth in questions for you. Um, are interceptors a one-time use? Are they able to be used more than once? Uh, is there a recommendation as to how many pitfall traps are needed per bed? And do you need one per bed or do you recommend one under each bed post? Wow, those are good questions. Um, so they can be used repeatedly. Um, sometimes they need to be replaced if they're, if they're damaged, um, but as they get dirty, they need to be cleaned. Depending on the interceptors, they may need some other maintenance. The climb up interceptors um, typically require, uh, they have a talc powder, talcum powder on the inside. They need to be relubricated uh, periodically, usually every couple weeks. Um, the blackouts are designed to not need uh, that level of maintenance and the volcanoes require uh, very little maintenance. So as long as there's not a lot of particles or things that allow uh, create bridges for the bed bugs out of the interceptors, um, you know, that's, then it's going to be working. So maintenance varies between the different types. Um, and then they just need to be replaced if they just reach a, a point where they're, you know, just too dirty or too damaged. Um, in terms of the number to use, uh, there was a recent study by Karen Vale at University of Tennessee that, that tried to look at how many interceptors are needed. And in her study, and her results were, were quite surprising, um, she found that you could, you could detect bed bugs um, with a single interceptor um, underneath the beds. And uh, I still would recommend um, Placing interceptors, um, it, well, it depends which interceptor you're using. If you're using the under the leg interceptors, I would still recommend, um, you know, under each corner of the bed and under each leg of the furniture. Sometimes you get furniture that's got 16 legs, so you don't need to necessarily do all 16 legs, but, you know, certainly you want to get the, the um, outer legs at a minimum. Um, so it, it really then comes back to, um, you know, what you can afford to do. The, I think the more interceptors you put out, the more likely you are to detect infestations. Um, the volcanoes and the active volcanoes are off the leg interceptors are typically recommending uh, two interceptors under the bed and two interceptors underneath the upholstered furniture. Um, so it, there's not a hard and fast rule. Um, so some of it does come back to what are your, uh, what are your financial resources? What can you invest? Okay, thank you. Um, does it matter if mattress and box ring encasements are plastic or cloth? Um, that's a great question, and it's a question that we're currently looking at. Um, initially, years ago, I would have said that, you know, uh, plastic encasements are a bad idea because they rip and they tear, but we're, we're finding that the plastic encasements are very difficult for bed bugs to uh, remain on. Uh, they, they don't have sticky pads on their feet. They have claws and so they can't really navigate the slippery surface of the plastic encasements. And we find that a lot of people in affordable housing uh, leave their beds in plastic. So we're actually doing research on that now, trying to look at what is the impact of plastic versus fabric. And it's, at, at this point, we don't have answers for that. One thing I can tell you, which is interesting though, is if you do have plastic or vinyl encasements on beds, um, it drives the bed bugs off of the bed. Um, so in other words, you're much more likely to find bed bugs in linens and in fitted sheets uh, on beds that have plastic encasements than you are on fabric encasements. Um, you're also more likely, we believe you're more likely to find bed bugs off of beds when plastic encasements are being used. But again, this is something that we're presently looking into um, in some research trials. Okay. Um, and along those, the encasement line, somebody asked, um, what about residual pesticides in lieu of encasements? I th think you may have covered that. Yeah, I've never, I, I've never been an advocate of applying pesticides to sleeping areas. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are labeled. So as long as the label permits it, it's not illegal to do that. But I still think it's a poor choice. Um, encasements are more effective. We, we know that, first of all, many of these pesticides aren't going to work in the first place, and the sleeping areas are a sensitive area, and the encasements are a far, far more effective tool. So while they may be more expensive, um, I think it's the appropriate tool to be using for beds. 
And do you need a special vacuum or standard vacuum? Does a standard vacuum work for pest control? Well, okay, so again, you know, not a totally simple answer. A standard vacuum will work just fine. Um, however, we don't know what the implications are for um, for allergens. So we know that like with uh, vacuuming for roaches or vacuuming for rodent droppings, uh, we want HEPA filter vacuums to contain uh, the proteins and the, the allergens from being spewed out into the air. Uh, we don't know what the impact is for uh, bed bugs, so a HEPA filter would be recommended, but but we don't know that it's absolutely necessary. Uh, but but the strength of the vacuum doesn't really matter. Any vacuum is going to be sufficient to remove bed bugs from surfaces. You're not going to remove bed bugs from deep within cracks and crevices, especially especially texture surfaces like wood. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna dig into those areas, and that's where steam really takes over for where vacuums have their limitations. The biggest thing with vacuums is you have to be very careful about the vacuums becoming infested. So there's a lot of proper care that goes into using vacuums, how you're handling it afterwards, uh, immediately removing the, the bag, checking the vacuum uh, for bed bugs, uh, you know, sealing the vacuum bag and discarding it and keeping the vacuum in a sealed container between um, uses. You should have a dedicated vacuum that's used for bed bug work and nothing else. Um, because we don't we don't want to have uh, dispersal or movement of bugs via the the vacuum as a tool. So there there is a little bit that goes into the use of vacuums. Okay, I have um, a couple of questions on heat that I'm going to combine. The question, the first question I got was, what's more effective, heat or pesticides? And then another question regarding heat regarding heat treatments is, how about um, heater heating equipment used to heat complete apartments? How effective and how long? is it used for and what's the temperature to maintain? Okay, so again, uh, a little bit involved questions. I'll yeah. try and uh, get to the Reader's Digest answer. <laughs> um, heat is the Achilles of the bed bug. So heat is the most effective way of, of destroying bed bugs and their eggs. This is why uh, hot laundering is so strongly recommended or hot drying items. Um, again, you know, trying to compare any of these methods to pesticides. I would always say that, you know, with pesticides, you never know what you're going to get. So would I recommend heat over a, a heat approach only versus a pesticide approach only? Absolutely, because we have such resistance issues with pesticides, you just, you really just don't know how effective they're going to be. Um, that being said, heat is typically not considered a standalone solution either, and it's usually used in conjunction with pesticides, uh, usually in conjunction with desiccant dusts like silica dusts. Um, sometimes with pesticide sprays. Um, so whole structure heat treatment for apartments is a very effective tool, but you have to recognize that it will not overcome clutter problems because the key to heat working is airflow. You have to have convection, and if you have a lot of clutter and things on the floor, uh, the bed bugs are going to move to those areas where the clutter exists because the heat won't penetrate those areas. So when you have highly cluttered apartments or you have infestations that are inside of wall voids, heat is prone to failure in those situations. It's also prone to failure in solid concrete construction compared to wood construction. Um, so it's a very involved process, but it is a very effective process when done correctly. Uh, temperatures typically need to be um, raised to about 120 degrees. At 120 degrees, you're going to have uh, lethal temperatures, but but that's the that's the critical death point. So really, the ambient air temperatures are brought up to anywhere uh, between like 100 and you want you want all areas of the apartment to be at 120 degrees. And to do that, you need ambient temperatures to be higher than 120, more like 130, 140, and then a lot of manipulation of furniture and items within the apartment to get the heat to penetrate through all areas. So it's, it's an involved process. It typically takes, you know, a good solid six hours uh, or potentially longer to do an effective heat treatment. Okay. Um, here's a semi easy one. I'm assuming they mean pesticide treatments, but how often do you recommend treatments? Um, yeah. So treatments are, uh, you know, pretty, uh, typically recommended to be about two weeks apart, and that's based on the life cycle of the bed bug. Uh, you, you certainly, one week apart is too soon, and three weeks apart is too long. So typically, you know, uh, every 14 days, plus or minus a day or two, 
Um, but you know, you want to be somewhere in the 13 to 17 day mark uh, between visits, and that tends to be the, the most widely recommended. Okay. We're over time, but we still have a number of um, people still on listening, so I'm assuming people are still interested. Rick, are you okay to answer a couple more questions? Uh, sure, we can go for a bit longer. Just uh, uh, two that uh, come up frequently for me I wanted to get to. Um, have you had experience using Apprehend, the new biopesticide, and if, you, if so, did you find success? Um, I personally haven't worked with it. Um, I know Jeff White uh, with Bedbug Central has done some work with it, and I think he may be doing some more work with it. So I think it's a, a little too early uh, for me to comment on it. I, I think it, it definitely has promise. So Apprehend, if you're not familiar with it, is this new uh, fungal pathogen product. It's a spray on fungal pathogen. Um, so there's, I think, still you know some questions out there to be answered, but I would say that it uh, definitely looks promising, and I think it will have a place uh, in bedbug management moving forward. I'm just not quite sure what its place is going to be. Okay, and what about the permethrin um, mattress liners? The um, yeah, the right. So these are uh, chemically impregnated uh, mattress liners that get placed on mattresses and/or box springs. Um, I've never been a fan or an advocate of putting an impregnated uh, cover on a mattress. I know that the manufacturer of the product has um, really started moving more towards using these for the box springs and less for the mattress so that it's not in areas where people are sleeping. Um, so I know that people are using them, um, but still I feel that a full encasement offers more benefits than a, uh, a chemically impregnated liner. That's really personal opinion. Okay, and this one I'm gonna just answer for you. IGRs, not effective, uh, not a very good product for bed bugs, not extremely effective, correct? Yeah, a lot of um, conflicting results throughout uh, okay. the, the studies that have been done. So no real consensus on uh, the role of IGRs right now in the use of, you know, as a bed bug control product. And this one is a easy answer I'll take, but um, just bears um, repeating. Do bed bugs carry disease? Not that we know of right now, but there is new evidence that they may trigger allergies. Um, and then lastly, there was a couple questions, but I'm just gonna um, paraphrase. Can you just explain the difference between dusts and liquid pesticides and how dusts are used and um, that's different than how liquid pesticides are used? Um, so, I mean, liquid pesticides are typically considered residual materials. They're applied through uh, low pressure spray application equipment. And then there's also aerosols. And, and these products work best for contact kill. Uh, the bugs that you spray are going to be the most likely to be those that are affected. Once they dry, um, residual effectiveness can be very variable from uh, effective to not effective at all. And uh, so it just really depends on the product and not just the product, but the population and their level of resistance. Um, the dust materials, um, it, you know, I guess the easiest thing to try and compare it to would be something like talcum powder. They're very fine dusts. Um, there are both chemical dusts uh, and there are non uh, chemical dusts like the uh, desiccant dust. So there's a product out there called Semexa, which is a uh, silica-based dust, which has been shown to be very highly effective. Uh, one of the advantages of the dusts is that they offer uh, residual effectiveness. They're uh, not a toxic kill. Uh, they're a physical kill. They dehydrate the insect and uh, cause water loss, so they're less likely to um, have issues with resistance. I mean, we haven't seen any resistance to date with the desiccant dusts. Uh, they're also desirable because, again, they're not a toxin. Um, but the challenge with these dusts is that they're very light and uh, difficult to apply. So there's a little bit more uh, time and skill required in the proper application of the dust than there is the liquids. Okay. Um, oh, one last one that I missed. Do you think the flooring material, this is kind of interesting, does the flooring material uh, impact the dispersal, like carpet versus wood or tile? Did you notice any patterns? I think the, the question is probably like, 
you know, apartment managers might wonder, should we just be tearing up carpet and replacing it? No, we, well, we didn't, uh, we didn't specifically look at the flooring type at, in regards to dispersal, but I, I can tell you that we, we had, um, so we didn't, we didn't specifically run statistics on that variable, uh, mm -hmm. but we had uh, many apartments with linoleum tiles and many apartments with um, carpets. And I can tell you on the surface without a statistical analysis that I, I don't believe there was really a difference in what we saw as far as dispersal goes. Okay, so there's a few more questions that I'm gonna take on. The, um, the new tenants, um, Francis Zimmer asked about new tenants. I'm gonna reply to that privately. Um, trans, uh, someone asked about cars. I will answer that one privately. Someone asked about mice and I'm gonna answer that privately. So if you didn't get your question answered live today, we will be posting these questions on the website, stoppest.org. I'll have a link right on the homepage so you don't have to remember a, a long uh, website. Um, but also, um, I will try to get back to you by email for some of these questions that take a little more in-depth to answers. I'll, I'll answer you directly by email. Um, I have everybody's email associated with the questions. So I, at this time, I just want to, I'm going to end the meeting and thank uh, Rick for his time and his expertise. And again, if you are interested in applying this assessment-based approach to your housing site, Rick is uh, been so generous to offer his advice and his email address so you can see that on the on the website and if you have follow-up questions just about bed bugs in general you can always send them to stoppest at cornell.edu so thank you everybody for joining us today and check back on the website in a couple days the recording will be up and you can share that recording with your colleagues um, thanks everybody thank you rick again okay, for yeah time. and i'd like to thank everybody as well and i apologize for the uh the coughing episodes uh so in any event, thank you for, for tolerating that. Oh, you're human. <laughs> Lo and behold. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody, and have a good afternoon.